John, thank you. We're calling this Culture Stories. And as you know, you and I share a lot of passion uh, and interest around culture. But I wanted to kick off uh, really by asking you to define culture and, and company culture a little bit. How would you go about describing it? So I would describe company culture. First of all, it's great being here. And I'm not sure the technology can handle the combined passion between yourself and myself. That said, <laughs> culture's absolutely everything. Um, it's very, very difficult to put the definition of culture into words because it's something that you really have to kind of feel. But to me, culture is, in a word, connectivity. It's a sense of belonging between an individual and the greater whole. Now, how we define the greater whole is a multi-sensory experience that I think at the end of the day leaves someone feeling like they belong, that they have a voice, and that they matter in the context of a broader organization. But that connectivity, I think, on every level, on an emotional level, on a physical level, on a mental level, is everything um, as it relates to the essence of any organization. And as culture goes, so does the company in my experience. Bang on. So a, a quick follow up to that, because do you believe that culture is something that you need to manage or is it something that you can just let evolve and flow within an organization? You know, that is a great question. And, you know, it's kind of both. You have to kind of let it flow, but you also have to create, I think, some sort of a framework um, within which culture needs to thrive. Imagine like a garden bed, if you will. You can plant different things in the garden bed, but the garden bed itself needs to have some sense of, of definition, I think. And, um, in the ebb and flow of culture, another thing that I have found is that you can't create culture out of nothing. You can't create culture out of vapor. You need to have the essence of culture be very real and authentic and rooted in, I think, some essence of the organization itself. So to me, that frame needs to be in a different word, the values of the organization. So imagine the corners of that garden being the core values that represent the organization. And then I think with the employees, with the constituents that make up that organization, whatever that organization is, it could be citizens, it could be constituents, it could be other stakeholders, they together with management have an opportunity to further define, to further enhance, to evolve, to strengthen what that essence of the organization, i.e. the culture, really is at the end of the day. And, and you raise this beautiful point because it's, it's often how we describe it, that culture is always leader-led and, and people-driven. So if it's just leader-led, it, it's dictatorship. If it's just people-driven, it's a revolution. You need both. And so both. So it's this dance. And that's the subtlety and, and often the difficulty of how you manage that movement and flow between control and letting go. Is that how it seems to you? I think so. But I also think that there is a little bit of um, there's a little bit of gum like there, there are some ingredients in that gumbo known as culture that I think you have an opportunity to kind of grab onto. So, yes, it's leader led. And yes, the foundation of the employee base ultimately is what makes up the culture. But I think that there's a middle ground there and that there are some individuals within that employee base that you'll seek to recognize as sort of the spark plugs, if you will, of culture. I know I'm mixing analogies between vegetables and spark plugs, but run with me on this in that you will find that there might be someone at a more junior level or a mid-senior level to whom others sort of gravitate because they're sort of the energizers, the radiators of the organization. You know, within any organization, you're going to find there are people that are drains. Those are the people that kind of suck the air out of a room. You probably don't want to build a culture around those individuals, but there are others to whom, to whom the broader employee base, they look to 
as either a barometer of the health of the organization, as energizers, you know, as sort of people that will bring others together. And I think those individuals are key to connecting the employees with the leadership as far as culture is defined. And as a leader, how would you, well, how do you find those people? How you find those people, I think, depends upon the context or the moment in which the organization exists. So, for example, the last three years, how you find those individuals yeah. might be slightly different than how we found those individuals when everybody was in the office five days a week, eight hours a day on average. Of course, in advertising, it's 15 hours a day. But, you know, the context kind of matters. But I think, you know, you'll find these individuals because they're, because they're the individuals who will reach out. They're the individuals who will ask the questions. They're the individuals, you know, you can see a lot by observing. It's a great Yogi Berra quote. Not that I follow Yogi Berra, or, you know, religiously, but every now and then I sort of chuckle. I look back on these brilliant quotes that Yogi Berra didn't even know he was making. And one is, you can see a lot just by observing. You can look across, whether they be events, meetings, whether it be in Zoom or whether it be physical meetings in, in an office environment, and you will see, you will feel that there are individuals that just have a voice and they make that voice heard. And they say constructive things and they're optimistic and they're energizing and they're radiant in their personalities as well as their point of view on and their passion for the organization. Those are the people that you want to rally around. Mm -hmm. Early in my career, I had a mentor. His name was Phil Duesenberry. And he was one of the great advertising legendary figures. Uh, and he invented phrases like GE, we bring good things to life. Pizza right. Hut, making it great. Or Pepsi, choice of a new generation. And Phil Duesenberry sat down with me one day. He was a soft speaker. So you'd have to really lean in to hear him. And he said to me once, John, in your career, you will find there are people who are big advocates of you and your organization, and there are big detractors of that organization. And there are a bunch of people in the middle. And one of the keys to success is to keep those people in the messy middle from spending too much time with the detractors. Right. <laughs> it was so silly and so simple but and obvious, but... By the fact of him saying it, it got me thinking, and it's absolutely spot on true. Mm -hmm. There are those who lean forward and lean in, and they're the passionate ones. They're the advocate. They're the optimists. They're the dreamers. And then there are those who are detractors. Mm -hmm. Make sure that the, the, the bulk of the middle, that they look to the people who are the passionate optimists versus the detractors. John, that's so true because we've worked together, and I've noticed how in various meetings you have sat back you have w welcomed in voices from around the table around the room all levels within an organization and that's you i guess taking those moments to notice what is going on who's saying what the temperature of the room and maybe being the last one to speak or maybe not speaking at all and is that something is that a sort of dare i say it a learnt behavior i don't know if it's learned or whether it's sort of part of my personality. I, I'm not exactly sure, Alistair, but I, I think that it's something that I try and remind myself because I'm fairly, I'm a kind of extroverted personality. And so my tendency is to speak sometimes before I think. So what I'm trying hard to do, and it is intentional, and believe it or not, I actually have to think about it in the context of being in a meeting or listening to others, but it's so important to just sometimes not speak. And there's a lot that can sometimes be spoken by not speaking, if that makes any sense. And I think it's really, really key to allow enough air in the room so that others can, can get oxygen and they can speak their mind. Because I th again, going back to the essence of culture, mm -hmm. if there are people that are part of that culture, even if, they're the not, even if they're not the instigators or the leaders of that culture, if they feel like they don't have a voice or that their voice doesn't matter, then the whole proposition comes tumbling down. So even if you don't agree with something that someone says, giving them the opportunity to have a voice, I think is fundamental to the broader employee base feeling collectively like they belong and that they have a place.
you know? I think the idea of open exchange of ideas, at least in the cultures I've been a part of, is a fundamentally important part of that culture. So I think listen, there's a lot of power in, in sometimes not saying anything and, and listening. You have to be a good listener as well as a good contributor. Now, I've got a three-part question for you, which is revolves all around the lives we've been living for the last two and a half or so years. Because when you look at culture in organizations and you look pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and now as we come through it, you begin to go, gosh, it's, 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 it's like shining through a, a prism. It's, it's become crystal clear to some of us about the power and the impact uh, and you talk about belonging, and when we were initially remote, you're scratching your head going, how do I bring my team together, you know, in 15 kitchens? So I was wondering whether you could give us three snapshots of what what life was like culture-wise in your organization pre-pandemic. How were you managing it then? And then as we go into the pandemic, what did you change? And then we'll come on to post later. So can we do pre and during? Absolutely. So I think the broader framework, the umbrella of my learning through the pandemic is that the scarcest resource of all is time. And how we use the precious time that we have in the most valuable ways, I think is my biggest takeaway to make the moment matter. But let's take down the let, let's, let's digest and dissect the time known as the pandemic. I think it breaks down into three phases. The first phase was fear. The second phase was uh, coming together or connectivity. And the third phase was action. Um, and I can't give you exact timelines, but you know, initially when the world shut down, uh, I can remember vividly uh, that it was March, I believe, 16th yeah. um, uh, of 2020, uh, shortly after the NBA had shut down. And I had come off uh, a lot of travel to and from the West Coast. And, um, and I remember when businesses shut down on that Monday. And the first thing we did was we called an all-hands meeting. And technologically speaking, one of the first hurdles was we weren't sure which platform to use because we've got roughly 2,000 people, you know, that are connected to OMD USA, and we and and we weren't sure Zoom could handle that amount of, of uh, of a, of that that number of attendees, and so we wound up having to do back to back all hands calls where we divided the the uh, the employee base the population into two sections. And we did uh, an all hands call and we talked a little bit about what we were going through, what our intent was, recognizing that, and I'm beaming in from my kitchen. Yeah. That's probably a good metaphor because it was a very messy time. It was messy in the kitchen when the pandemic first hit. And um, I think everybody at first wanted to know, number one, is everybody okay? Number two, how are we going to stay connected? And number three, how are we even going to approach getting work done with everybody working out of their houses? In, in, in one sense, we went from one headquarters office with other satellite agencies across the U.S. to overnight, suddenly we had 1,800 OMD USA offices. Nice. Everybody beaming in through their kitchens with their dogs, their family, their pets. And I remember that first phone call, and I remember several people reached out to me afterwards, and they said, wow, you know, John, you're really serious, and I'm, and I'm afraid. And I said, look, you know, no one's got the perfect answer here, but I will tell you that I've been through some pretty tough times, whether it be 9-11, whether, whether it's the Great Recession, and this is, and, and every single, you know, crisis is different. You know, it wouldn't be a crisis if it was exactly like the crisis before because we would know how to deal with it. Every crisis, by the definition of crisis, is different from the crisis that happened before. But I will tell you this. One of the keys is to stay together and to over-communicate. Enter phase two. Phase two, communication. How are we going to set up a cadence of communication where we can talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, very transparently? Somebody came to me early on and they said the most important thing we can do for our culture 
is to be absolutely transparent. We should set up an anonymous email box where any employee can send anything in and then John, you need to make sure on the all hands calls that you don't edit it. You've got to go right down those questions, even if they're uncomfortable and you have to read them because that will show our employees that you're not editing it out or you know, you're being incredible. Like transparency is so key to being real, honest, trusting and authentic. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, all right, I, I, I guess so. <laughs> it was the best advice I ever got because I'm on the call talking about like, you know, dear John, I have a bad back. I can't get the work done. I'm like, well, please reach out to me directly. I don't bite and we'll take care of getting you a chair. Um, other, other people would write in and be like, you know, I'm using more electricity than I was. Can the company pay me back? Well, unfortunately, no, we don't have a mechanism in place to enable us to do that. Another question, John, you seem disingenuous because you're telling us, uh, you know, we got to stick together and be okay. And I'm really fearful. I'm like, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry that you think that I'm not doing a good enough job, but let me tell you what my focus is right now, blah, 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 blah. So even if the answers weren't perfect, just by reading them out, even if they were, even if they were coming after me, I thought it was an important aspect of transparency and, and honesty that I think set the foundation for our communications and our connectivity going forward. Mm. Then, in, 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 again, in phase two, connectivity, another thing I started worrying about was fatigue and Zoom fatigue and losing okay. the audience because we were communicating in an entertaining kind of a way, really important information about our strategic plan, about ways employees could volunteer to get involved in new business efforts or other initiative groups that we were setting up around important topics like DE&I. And then what happened was because everybody was looking for the sense of belonging, people started looking at leadership and saying, what's your point of view on the insurrection at the Capitol? What's your point of view on George Floyd? What's your point of view on hatred against um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders? Like people would look to management and they would expect us to have a point of view. That created a bit of friction between what a normal CEO is being expected to comment on. Normally a CEO is supposed to be talking about the health of the business, not about, you know, cross-cultural trends and top news stories that are crossing, you know, our screens on an everyday basis. But again, we tried to walk a fine line and provide a perspective, whether it be a personal perspective or a broader perspective on the world at large. Why did we feel like that was appropriate? Because we're in the advertising and the communications business. So by by nature of the business we're in, we have to be attuned to culture. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on on phase two, but phase two was connectivity. I just want to come back. Sorry, Sorry. I just want to see, because I'm really interested in this whole idea of belonging uh, and, and actually helping people understand what that means because again this whole pandemic thing we sort of kind of knew what it was pre-pandemic pandemics changed everything here we are post-pandemic and and the role of work in many ways has has quite significantly changed so this whole idea of how do i belong and whether i'm a a, a junior associate just starting out in my late 20s or i'm a manager now having to manage people some are in some are out you know, etc. Or we've got a business leader who wants this magical gold dust called belonging. If I can get people to belong and feel they belong, this is the place they want to be right now. You know, everything will slot into place. So I'm, I'm really interested. But could I just ask you to imagine you're this young 25 year old just joining? What does belonging look like to you to these people nowadays? So I love imagining that I'm 25 years old again, because obviously I'm only 26. So it was last year. All right. So I'm going to imagine I'm 25 years old. So the first element of belonging is to make sure that while I'm sitting in my house in the middle of a pandemic and I'm zooming in to the company, that there are enough people on that call. So I get a sense that I'm in a place where there are a lot of my peers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I worried about was month three, month four of the pandemic was we would lose our audience because they'd be fatigued or they didn't feel like there was relevant information being communicated. Well, 
A, I had to make sure we were delivering relevant information attuned to what we're going through from a business perspective, but I also had to layer in some entertainment value. So we started sprinkling into the calls. I mean, advertising is a powerful business. Media and OMD was very powerful where I worked. So we had an opportunity to pull in some celebrities who were also sitting at home doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And so we'd have pop-ins. So we'd have like Bryce Harper. You know, the Phillies are in the World Series right now. Bryce Harper was our second guest. He popped in on the call and he talked about what it was like to being playing for the Phillies. You know, everything from his hair to playing in the outfield to this, that, and the other. And his view of what he's doing in the middle of the pandemic. Our people loved it. So they started getting a sense that in order to stay up with the Joneses on business and to get inspired by maybe a celebrity pop-in or two, we would get the audience to stick there. The second thing is, is that you have to recognize that the collective OMD population is made up of a lot of individuals. And individuals have individual interests and individual things that they're into. Now, it's impossible to be that relevant in an all-hands call, but I started getting into a rhythm of, you know, whether it was, you know, Black History Month or, you know, um, you know, uh, Pride Month or whatever, that we had an opportunity to, to talk in a way that was relevant to the context of the period of time that we were going through. And this got in some ways easier the longer the pandemic kind of extended, but in some ways harder in that you can only slice it so much and still be relevant to a broad section of our people. But you know, we had really interesting guests coming on talking about important things like what it's like to be, you know, uh, what it's like to come out as gay in the middle of a pandemic, you know, yeah. and, and having somebody who's on TV talking about that from his perspective to our broader audience gave some people in that audience a sense of like, wow, like, I can't even believe that we're talking about this as it relates to me. And I consider myself a minority in a broader Omnicom media group pool, but yet we're spending a few minutes talking about this, and this is so important to me. Wow, that's pretty cool. And over the course of time, you start to talk about things that you may not necessarily have talked about in the context of a broader all-hands meeting if we were all together in the office at one time. No. So, so we're using technology and we're using frequency, another media term, in a weird way to try and become our own marketers not by creating messaging out of vapor, but by being authentic and real, we had an opportunity to appeal to more individuals within the collective body, which is kind mm -hmm. of the high wire act of culture. How do you mm -hmm. keep everybody together as a whole, but how do you be specific and relevant enough to the individual interests of, of a person that sits within that broader enterprise and, 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 and not run the risk of becoming so personalized that you lose, that you lose the collective in the process? Yeah. Yes, totally. And I, it, it leads me on to something because the way we've described culture, and I know we, we've talked to you about this, is you mentioned earlier about these values, the, the kind of corner of the garden, if you like. We call it ambition, but your principles, your strategy, you know, all your commitments and so on, that's, that's the key. You, you have your behaviours, second area, that feed in and deliver that. But what's re what really supports the behaviours are these things that we call signals. And some of them are very formal, like your DE&I strategy, your staff survey, your staff appraisals. They happen. They're regular. You do them how you choose to do them. But there's often quite a lot of informal ones, one of which you've spoken about a great deal, which is communication. But I also think this idea of role modeling, not just the leadership, the senior managers, the managers, as you go down the ranks, that there's nothing <laughs> that beats consistent role modeling so you can have look something as if you like abstract as we believe in we, we've got to help people feel that they belong everyone has then got to go off and interpret that themselves and i just wondered how you 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 uh yourself sort of if you like managed that process of as it cascades down the the ranks and the levels you inspire those people three or four way levels below to kind of give them a structure, but give them room. That's great. I love that question. So let's go, before we attack that question, let's rewind the tape and let's go back to the three phases of the pandemic. Mm 
Yeah. Phase fu- phase one, fear, and how do we lean into fear and address it head on, and in the process, try and lower the heat down and keep the collective together. Phase two, connectivity, communication, that sense of belonging. Phase three, action. How do we recognize the actions of individuals at all levels of the company, even the most junior levels, and how do we put the spotlight on those individuals, recognize them, and use that, I don't mean to use the word use, but I am, use that as an opportunity to throw a carrot out there and say, hey, this individual, she did an amazing thing by stepping out of her comfort zone on a piece of business, and she had an idea for something that ultimately became a real thing. And look, this business is doing this thing that became an idea that she generated. Wouldn't it be great? And you've talked about that in the context of an all hands call. Maybe you even give that person an opportunity to beam in and we could recognize that person. And you know what happens? Everybody else in the company, they're looking at this and they have that Harry Met Sally moment. I'll have what she's having. I want to do what she's doing. You had me at hello. That becomes a repeatable pattern. It's almost like a snowball. You're on a hill. It's getting cold outside, right? So I'm going with the winter analogy now. And you roll that down the hill. It becomes bigger and bigger and more people get on board. It becomes a real thing. So we're trying to take these moments, these examples of people that have done brave things. Maybe someone in the Chicago office has the idea that, you know what, we're going to give out meals to first responders in Chicago, and we're gonna get the US Army account together because some of the reserves are there handing out the meals, and we're gonna show up on a Saturday, and we're gonna give meals out too. As a CEO of the company, I wanna know about that. More importantly, I want photos. And I'm gonna talk about it next week on the all hands call. And guess what happens? I get an email immediately after the call from the Wells Fargo team saying, we wanna do a community event. We want to do something cool. And then I get an email from the McDonald's team and they're like, you know something? There's an initiative coming up and we have an idea of where we want to like do some communications for McDonald's that talks about the people that are turning the lights on of the McDonald's local, you know, the, mo- the, the local restaurants mm-hmm. and, and McDonald's loves this idea and we're going to do something with McDonald's. Well, I want to talk about that too. And I want to talk about this and I want to talk about that. And then it becomes action. And then it becomes, you know something, we're actually working with our clients in a very messy, still the whiff of fear in the air, but you know what, we're not gonna let that daunt us. We're gonna stand up, brush ourselves off, lock arms with our fellow teammates, and we're gonna take action, we're gonna lead our way out of this mess that we're in. Mm -hmm. And by talking about it, it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy where others take notice, and they're like, you know what, I'm gonna move forward too. Because the worst thing we can do is sit there and just let dust collect. That's the worst thing. That's the quickest way to go right down the slope. The best way to work, the best way to get out of this mess is to go straight through it. And that's yeah. what we started talking about. And that's phase three called action. And that, yeah. was, that was the sort of like final chapter. Not that we're out of the pandemic, by the way. No, no. But, and we continue through. So this is, you know. This is not, there's no final chapter of this thing. This is still a book that is writ, being written as we speak right here, right now. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there are constantly new challenges, new ways to think about culture and new ways to inspire. But I do think it comes back to a sense of belonging. Mm, lovely, lovely. <clears throat> I just want to quickly uh, ask about, you know, you are a certain kind of leader, John. You are very people centric um you know how to draw the best out of them you respond to them you're very em- empathic what would you what advice would you give a completely different kind of leader someone who's just maybe more numbers person more you know just got to get the stuff done um because if culture is that important these people who see the world in a completely different light from let's say you and I and others will will need some thoughts and advice around that and if you how what what advice would you give a leader like that that's a great question i think to attack that question the first thing i would say is you have to have a real sense of self so Uh a leader has to be vulnerable enough to know what she or he is really great at 
and then what that particular individual might not be as strong at. And here's a news flash, spoiler alert, nobody's perfect. Um, Everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses. Mm. Um, Weaknesses is probably the wrong word. Uh, Maybe gaps is a better word, you know? Mm. So for someone that may not be quite the extrovert, maybe someone is more introverted, maybe someone is more interested in numbers, less sort of comfortable or confident around people or less confident communicating. The fact of the matter is, is that as long as that person has a sense of self or has other people around them that can, can help that person understand that sense of self. Like I, I always have people around me that will tell me in vivid color, very directly, (laughs) like what I'm great at and what I'm horrible at. And I've always really, really valued that to be completely honest with you. So for example, if I'm an extrovert and I'm really great with people and maybe I'm less inclined to fully understand some of the circuitry and some of the wiring behind an element of our business, I better darn well make sure I've got someone right next to me joined at the hip that is really, really good at that. So let's say I'm more introverted. I I need to have, and I need to be comfortable having right next to me, somebody who's more extroverted that is really good at communicating. I need that. And I need to be comfortable as a leader being open enough to allow that person to come into the sun, into the glare of the sun, the the spotlight, if you will, Mm -hmm. to be able to be right by my side in that. The idea of leadership of the individual that sits way up in the ivory tower (laughs) with everybody else sort of down here. That will not fly in today's world. You have to understand what you're great at, and then you have to understand that you need people with you at the senior level to round out you know, the, at the essence of what the overall package is that you need to lead an organization forward. So shared leadership, combined leadership, I'm not sure what the right terminology is, I I like to go back to servant leadership because as a servant of my clients, of my people, of my constituents and my stakeholders, I understand one thing. And that one thing is I am not perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I go into any situation knowing I think I can bring a lot to the party, but I need people around me to round out the overall proposition, to take Mm -hmm. some of the more inspirational things that I'm saying, to take some of the things that I think are roughly right. And those people can make them perfectly right. And I think this is probably a lovely place in which we can round up and finish here, because I, I, what I'm hearing you saying, John, is is richness, diversity in all its many and inclusion in all its many uh, iterations is one of the things. And it's not, of course, just a learning from the pandemic it goes way back, but it is now so embedded in how we think and how we move forward, that we need this richness. You're describing, you know, leaders need people not like them around them in this instance to certainly be aware of the culture and how you evolve the culture, because culture is a live thing. It is living. You know, you can set it and go, our culture is we are, you know, we act with integrity and honesty and all all these very well used words but it is living. And we've just witnessed this um, in the last three, four years, how living it is. So I just wondered whether you had any final thoughts about that. About, sorry, about um, the richness uh, and the diversity that we need. This we've, we've come to this point now in which we need, absolutely require, diversity and richness around us and that is what ultimately i think one of the uh, the the key ingredients of culture is these days i completely agree with you you know it wasn't that long ago that i remember earlier in my career this sort of sense that everybody needed to be kind of like a clone of of you know everybody needed to be kind of alike you know you needed people that could write long form stories that would be amazing commercials on TV. And there wasn't an appetite for people who could do short form or who could tell a story in the digital environment. Now, we spend so much time talking about diversity, oftentimes through the lens of demographic diversity. But I think more and more, 
we're seeing such richness and such fertile ground in creating cultures around diversity of thought, diversity of, of personality. Um, and I think that's really, really important. You know, I think that this notion of leadership being, being like so strong and powerful without any air of vulnerability, I, I have tended to, 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 to operate in a slightly different way and to try and use empathy and vulnerability, recognizing that nobody is perfect, almost as a strength as a way to bring a broader organization more closely aligned and together. And I think that if you're really tr striving to be an authentic and a real organization, and by that I mean real to the values of what the organization really holds true, I think you've got to understand that individuals are unique and you need to find some thread or some common ground around which people can rally. And, and I believe that and this is sort of paradoxical, that the best way to kind of keep people together is to recognize the individual traits and the individual differences that each of us possess. So the fact that I'm different, I think, from you, and the fact that you're different from me, and you start to mushroom that out a little bit more, that in a weird way is fundamental to keeping the broader whole together. Celebrating mm -hmm. the differences in a weird way will keep us closely aligned. Mm -hmm. So we've got a kind of ABC, haven't we? We've got authenticity, belonging, communication. You know, these are the sort of the themes that are coming through in maybe, you know, whatever order. And I just want to finally come back. You, you talked very eloquently earlier on. I talked about leader led, people driven. And you went, yes, and there's those people, those radiators. And I think one of the things for us to think about maybe is and then they don't all look alike either <laughs> because your radiators some of them might be uh, the awkward squad you know those rebels <laughs> it's so funny you say that alistair because i can close my eyes and i can think of all of these people at at very different levels you know at the entry level all the way up through to senior management I can think right here, right now of 20 individuals in the last three years that I've been blessed to work alongside that are representative of these kinds of radiators, without whom the organization would not be as good and as powerful as it is. Yeah, interesting. John, thank you. Any final thoughts, words, anything that you wanted to say about culture that I haven't teased out of you yet? No, other than the fact that Difference makers, I think, is a great handle for the whole thing because there are people who are not carbon clones of others within an organization that have the ability to move mountains. And I think that empathy and communication and I think, you know, I, and I think values are really the cornerstone of any organization. So what my invitation would be, any organization that doesn't have a crystal clear point of view on their values needs to do it immediately because that is the most important first step to understanding and unlocking the full power of what culture can mean to an organization. It's a force multiplier. Culture eats everything for breakfast. Yes, it's cliche, but here's, here's one for you, Alistair. It's absolutely true. Yeah. But it comes back to this point, sorry to draw this out, but it's a really good point about understanding yourself and understanding you've got the, the organization's values, what are your values? And, and, and how do they connect and link? They don't necessarily need to be all, you know, beautifully woven together, but there must be these connecting threads. You must be able to find that connection. 100% and be comfortable with sharing the spotlight with others that can help round you out. So yeah. me as an extrovert, you know, one of my blind spots is I might not be as technically expert on certain elements of the programmatic blockchain as another individual, recognizing that that is the future of a lot of things. So I got to make sure that I share the limelight with somebody that might be more expert in that. Similarly, if I'm more of a bookish kind of a person and imagine I'm an introvert, I need to be comfortable having somebody alongside me that can be more extroverted and more on the front foot with how we communicate the mission of the company. You just need to understand what your strengths are, 
what the gaps are, and then how to augment those gaps, recognizing that no one individual, I believe, in this world today can go it alone. You need to go, we're better together. And together, I think, is another key word um, that is the fabric and the glue of, of culture in an organization. And that comes back to your beautiful word about belonging. You know, we do, we do this together. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel a sense of belonging with you, Alistair, right here, right now in my kitchen. <laughs> Both in our kitchens. There you go. John, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to us about culture. The pleasure is mine.